A media frenzy began on November 24th, 1934, when the bodies of three female children were found in a forest near Pennsylvania Route 233. Identification of the bodies was a struggle for authorities, and when they asked for help, families across the nation sent in photographs and descriptions, desperate to find their own missing children. This week on Out of the Past, The Babes in the Wood Murders. Now, the title of this video, Babes in the Wood, could be referring to several different crimes, as multiple cases have been given the nickname, including the 1986 murders of Karen Hadaway and Nicola Fellows, as well as the 1947 murders of two still unidentified children in Vancouver, British Columbia. Both of those cases are tragic, and I might make videos on them in the future, but today, we're going back to the 1930s. In a reversal of the migration pattern for most Americans during the Great Depression, Elmo Noakes moved, penniless and widowed, from California back east to Pennsylvania in the early 30s. At the beginning of November, Elmo and his niece, Winifred Pierce, had purchased a blue Pontiac sedan, which they used to cross the country. Elmo was the legal guardian for three children, his own daughters, Dewilla and Cordelia, and his late wife's daughter from a previous marriage, Norma Sedgwick. Winifred lived with the family and spent her days caring for the girls. The cloud of the Great Depression hovered over the entire country. Nowhere was immune. In Pennsylvania, just as in California, the Nooks family struggled to make ends meet. The strange thing is, when the family left California, Elmo had a steady income. And even stranger, Elmo got out of town with two weeks of pay owed to him. Why would he do this? Why would he leave so abruptly? Why couldn't he wait for the extra $50 he had coming? It would have saved him a lot of trouble and heartache. Elmo and Winifred struggled after leaving California. They mostly lived in campgrounds across the country before finally arriving in Pennsylvania. There are accounts of Elmo begging for any kind of work he could get in Philadelphia. The owner of a diner positively ID'd Elmo and claimed Elmo had told him, my children are becoming a burden to me. Sometime in September of 1934, Elmo took out life insurance policies on everyone in the family. An interesting financial choice. He had to pay the premium on these policies during a time when the country was sinking financially. Spending money on an eight-year-old's life insurance policy doesn't seem like a prudent financial decision. But things start making a little more sense when you learn that that encounter in the Philadelphia restaurant, when Elmo was looking for work, was the last time anyone ever saw the children alive. In the days afterwards, Elmo and Winifred were spotted by witnesses several times. They hitchhiked to Altoona, Pennsylvania, where they sold Winifred's coat to a pawn shop for $2.55. With that money, they purchased a shotgun. There were no reported sightings of either Elmo or Winifred after the transaction. On November 24th, two hikers, John Clark and Clark Jardine, stumbled upon something horrifying. On their way to chop firewood on South Mountain, they saw a green blanket thrown over something strangely shaped. It was unusual to come upon something like this, so the two investigated. Under the blanket laid the bodies of Norma Sedgwick, 12, Dwilla Noakes, 10, and Cordelia Noakes, who was only eight years old. Witness accounts had described the scene as like three little girls sleeping, all cuddled together. The discovery was huge news, and the case touched people all over the country. Many families sent in photographs asking if any of the bodies found could be their missing children. Over 10,000 people flocked to the public viewing and the funeral, heartbroken by this senseless tragedy in a world that seemed already replete with senseless tragedies. Leads came in from every direction, but none proved viable. They even created death masks for the girls. 
worried they'd be even more difficult to identify after burial. Authorities not only struggled to identify the children, they also faced challenges in determining a cause of death. The medical examiner finally decided on suffocation. The media frenzy was big, but the mystery didn't last long. Elmo and Winifred were found the next day, both dead from gunshot wounds. Winifred had two, one in the head and one in the heart. Elmo died of a single shot to the head. Ballistics confirmed that the shots came from the same gun the two had purchased with the money they got for Winifred's coat. Within a week, investigators were able to connect the dots back to the dead children, and it didn't take them long to identify the girls after that. The whole family, everyone who had been in the blue sedan traveling east from California, was now dead. So that's where the story ends, but plenty of questions remain. First and foremost, what led Elmo to commit these heinous crimes? He had insurance policies on all the children, but neither he nor Winifred were alive to benefit from the payout. The media and police ran away with a particular theory, that Elmo killed himself and his family because times were too hard, and he simply couldn't afford to provide for them anymore. You still hear about this case when people bring up stories of people losing their minds during the Depression. There are several pieces of evidence to support this theory. The first being the fact that the girls' stomachs were close to empty upon their autopsies. They showed signs of having poor nutrition. There are stories of the children being elated when invited to dine with other families and campgrounds. And, of course, there are Elmo's words. My children are becoming a burden to me. So, while this theory is interesting and might hold some clout, there are other things that should be examined. Why did Elmo and Winifred hitchhike all the way to Altoona to commit this murder-suicide or whatever happened? Altoona is more than 100 miles away from where they dumped the children's bodies. Were they going to kill the kids and run, but their subsequent grief changed their minds? Why were there some people who refused to acknowledge Elmo's guilt? Back in Rosewood, California, his old friend, Chief of Police E.E. E. York, insisted that it had to have been an accident. He said that the children must have been unintentionally killed by exhaust fumes. There was no evidence to support his claims. Some people, including two of Elmo's sisters, chose to blame Winifred. Though nobody knows the real details of their relationship, many say Elmo was enamored by his own niece, and this was all just a plot to run away with her. Two of Elmo's sisters blame not only Winifred, but her whole side of the family, telling Elmo's third sister, if it hadn't been for your family, he'd still be alive. Winifred was treated as a soulless femme fatale, with the sisters claiming that Winifred could get Elmo to do anything she wanted. In reality, she was a murder victim, and we have no idea what preceded that. Other family members have simply said to ignore the sisters, as all the family drama was probably what prompted Elmo to leave California in the first place. I see this as a classic family annihilator case. It happened back then, just like it happens now. To me, Elmo Noakes doesn't seem much different from a Josh Powell, a Chris Benoit, or a Chris Watts. We don't know why it happens, but it's the same phenomenon. The unanswered questions like, why did he run, don't take away from this theory. Remember that Robert Fisher was never found after killing every family member but the dog. Norma, DeWilla, and Cordelia were laid to rest in Westminster Cemetery. Elmo was buried there as well, but in a different location. There's a marker on Pennsylvania Route 233 that reads, On this spot were found three babes in the woods, November 24th, 1934. That's the end of our story today on Out of the Past. 
If you're interested in learning more about cases of this nature, I would recommend the Cold podcast that just came out from the KSL news radio station in Utah. Uh, that follows the case of Josh and Susan Powell and their two little boys, Charlie and Brayden. And they do a really good job examining the psychology involved. I would really recommend that podcast. I'll see you again next week on Out of the Past.